Uh, I'd like to start uh, just with a question. Uh, how many of you here know uh, what this is? Uh, and no, it is not the latest addition to the slot bowl furniture line at IKEA. <laughs> no one? Uh, it's an old piece of equipment. It's rather large, and it was made by Xerox in the late 1970s uh, called the Dover, and it was the world's first laser printer. Yes, one of these. And I have a special place in my heart for the Dover because I was an undergraduate, and I had a chance to spend uh, part of a summer at Carnegie Mellon University, and Carnegie Mellon University, at the time I visited, had one of the world's three Dover laser printers, one of the only three laser printers in operation in the world. And the wonderful thing about Carnegie Mellon's Dover is that anyone, even a visiting undergraduate student like me, was allowed to print on it. And so when I discovered this, I ran back to the nearest computer terminal I could find, typed in a document, sent it to the Dover, ran back to the Dover, took this sheet of paper, and thought to myself, someday, I don't know when, maybe five years from now, maybe 50 years from now, but if I'm lucky, I'll live long enough to see the day when everyone can print on a laser printer. <laughs> now, um, and in fact, uh, the purpose of my talk today, of course, is uh, pulling from the future. Uh, and while I was able to have the prescience to see that this was the future, I couldn't really understand the full implications of this. And it's a silly thing in a way, but of course the laser printer uh, inspired people to develop typesetting languages, which kicked off a huge desktop publishing uh, industry, a billion dollar industry, uh, which unleashed hordes of self-publishers and writers and bloggers, which today are threatening to bring down huge publishing empires. I think it's just really cool. <laughs> Isn't the future cool? Well, <clears throat> in fact, the bigger story about this, and the thing I didn't understand in the late, late 1970s, is that this was just one of many emerging stories in technology uh, that pertain to the concept of democratization. The idea that surprisingly disruptive things can happen when powerful technologies, technologies that at one point were only for the privileged few, or maybe just for the one or two superpower governments, become available to everyone. And the surprises that can happen when that democratization takes place uh, can be disruptive. Now, this takes on special meaning for me now because uh, I have take a, taken a temporary leave of absence from my position at Carnegie Mellon. Uh, three months ago, I started uh, work uh, for the government in public service uh, for the Blue Sky Research Agency for the Department of Defense uh, called DARPA, the Defense Advanced Research Projects Agency. And uh, let me just spend one minute to tell you about DARPA. DARPA started in 1958 uh, in the wake of the Russian launch of Sputnik, which was a tremendous uh, cathartic surprise for the US government. The fact uh, that space was a new frontier that could be owned uh, by a competing superpower. And so in the wake of Sputnik, DARPA was founded with the specific mission to prevent technological surprise in the future. And since that time, DARPA has become uh, a powerful engine for staying abreast of technology developments. Uh, DARPA designed and launched the first GPS satellite, uh, embarked on the question, would it be possible to make an invisible airplane leading, leading to stealth technology? Uh, it's unrolling now amazing new prosthetics uh, that are an outgrowth of uh, decades of robotics research. And of course, in 1969, almost 40 years to the day, today, uh, launched the ARPANET, which eventually became the internet. And it's a remarkable time right now, owing to the fact that it's 40 years. And in fact, just two weeks ago, a book uh, hit the streets called The Department of Mad Scientists, which is actually the story of the 40 years of DARPA. And I think this gives me license to say that I'm now a bona fide mad scientist. Uh, maybe not quite like this, but uh, getting there. Now, uh, 40 years ago, uh, 1969, uh, was a big year in science and technology development. Uh, this is a picture of Neil Armstrong. I'm sure many of you uh, old enough uh, uh, are familiar with this picture. Uh, in fact, ARPA order number one, the first funded project uh, by the DARPA, uh, led and contributed directly to the Saturn V booster rocket that put a uh, man on the moon. And this was a major achievement in science and technology for mankind. A safe Earth orbit, 
lunar orbit, soft landing on the moon, and thousands of other technologies, not to mention marshalling the resources of tens of thousands of people, all oriented towards the same common goal, to put a man safely on the moon and bring him back. In that same year, the ARPANET was born, and by the end of that year, the ARPANET had four nodes on it. And a researcher at Stanford Research Institute looked at the ARPANET not just as an indestructible communications network that could withstand a nuclear war, but as something much greater, as something that might be a tool to augment human intellect, that might lead to a new, as he put it, way of life in an integrated domain where hunches cut and try intangibles and the human feel for a situation usefully coexist with powerful concepts and high-powered electronic aids. It's hard to emphasize how visionary that statement was in 1969. And you can see here Doug Engelbart in that year, in fact, I think it's literally 40 years to the day, conducted what is known in computer science research circles as the mother of all demos, built his own mouse, the first mouse, and demonstrated the possibility that multiple people in geographically uh, dispersed areas could actually work together to create a document. An amazing achievement. All this happened 40 years ago, 1969. Now, I've had some time to reflect and think, 40 years, which of these two major achievements had more impact? It's a little bit of a, uh, apples and oranges comparison, but let's try to do it anyway. And for me, and it's not just because I'm a computer science, scientist, although maybe it is, um, I think the answer is very clear. And I would ask you to think about this by asking, <laughs> has your child used a Saturn V booster rocket to be entertained? Uh, has your child used lunar landing technology to reinforce uh, his or her school lessons? Um, has your child uh, used high Earth orbit to uh, steal credit card numbers or to download porn? <laughs> the point here is the power of democratization. Now, I'm working for the Defense Department, and the Defense Department actually cares a lot about democratization, like this the amazingly disruptive and surprising things that can happen. Why? Well, the DARPA is supposed to prevent technological surprise, and it's absolutely clear that surprise comes out of this type of democratization. Some contemporary examples. A graduate student at George Mason University uh, went on a guided tour in North Korea, came back and started a Google mashup, just indicating the things that he had seen. This attracted interest of other people who had done the same thing and asked if they could contribute to his mashup. He, of course, said yes. Former military people found this. They contributed. Other, as the Wall Street Journal put it, busybodies uh, who just like reading things on the web, talking to relatives, perhaps back in Korea uh, or in China, uh, putting two and two together and connecting the dots to some pixels on, on the map, uh, identified more things to the point where the entire physical infrastructure of North Korea has now been identified, the most secretive society on the planet. And in fact, all of that including uh, about 200 locations of anti-aircraft battery locations uh, in the country, the secret location of Camp 16, uh, mass burial sites from the last famine, and the list goes on and on. The government cares about this because anyone can do this. It's a complete democratized technology that only 10 years ago required a government, and perhaps only four or five governments in the world, to spend billions of dollars to launch a satellite and to train legions of spies in order to get the same uh, information. Surprises come oftentimes from what are called colliding exponentials. In genetic engineering, we are seeing the exponentially decreasing cost of gene assembly and the exponentially increasing ability to write DNA. And that combination, that collision of exponentials, is inspiring young people uh, every year growing exponentially, a third colliding exponential, to, in their garages and in their basements and in their school laboratories, to think about 
what could they do if they could write DNA as though it were computer code? There are wonderful possibilities in bioremediation, biosynthesis of, uh, and echoremediation of uh, pollutants, uh, but there are also pranks. Uh, already, someone has created glowing plants. What will the public uh, reaction be when we wake up to seeing glowing purple birds someday, or worse? These are technological surprises that we care about. Uh, this is a picture, of course, that is very familiar to those of us uh, having lived through the space age, uh, a picture from a low Earth orbit. This picture was taken by a group of high school students. And in fact, it's not just a picture, but it's a video. Uh, and uh, what did they do? Uh, it's very simple. They put things up in a very, very robust weather balloon. Oh, it just popped. Uh, and uh, they used a uh, handheld GPS in order to find this thing in some Iowa cornfield after it landed and downloaded the video. What happens when space itself becomes democratized? Now, these things, of course, are very, very important to stay abreast. And what we see now as the ability for very powerful technologies becomes highly democratized, we're finding increasing possibilities for technological surprise. Uh, we've just launched the DARPA Network Challenge. You should all compete. On December 5th, there will be eight or 10 weather balloons, eight feet in diameter, in secret locations, but publicly accessible throughout the United States. If you are the first to identify the locations of all 10, you get $40,000. Who will win? Well, maybe it won't be an American. The world is completely connected. In fact, that could happen because few things inspire like technology and the empowerment that comes along with it. In June, we of course saw this in vivid detail where the power of empowerment and democratization along with connectivity through powerful technologies came into confluence through 220,000 tweets, Twitter tweets per hour in protest of the Iranian elections. Democratized technologies, those same democratized technologies were used by the Iranian government itself to cut off that access to Twitter, to FriendFeed, to Facebook, and to other social media sites. And they used, again, democratized technologies, technologies that we considered good for protecting our networks were used now for the cause of suppressing freedom and democracy. And so when technologies go dem uh, democratic, uh, surprising things happen. Technology democratization isn't just a tool for suppressing or promoting democracy, it is democracy. Thank you very much. Thank you, Peter.